All right, and welcome to Heller Barnes Live and uh, Ask Us Anything. And today, we, it's a fantastic uh, day. We were originally had Paul Rubin on, but we got an upgrade because Paul and Johnny are just being, uh, first off, their schedules change all the time. And this is the same for all of us. We all have something, something happens with our kids, something happens uh, where we have to do something different work-wise. And they were scheduled to work on this book together in a different week. And so now these low lowlifes are out recording the book about the Kennedys. <laughs> and Paul is directing and Heller is, uh, is narrating. And one of the funniest things, you know, Heller, we're gonna talk about this today because Paula, so many of you know Paul Rubin. If you don't, you absolutely should. And Paula is the upgrade version of him where she's joining us and she is a director and an actor and she's been involved in this scene for the last, we'll just say a little while like me, I'm a little older, so I've been around for a long time. And Heller left you hanging. Yes, well, he has this thing, like he's more loyal, this is terrible. He's more loyal to his publishing, uh, you know, the major publishing houses, just like his uh, uh, Paul Rubin. They, they kind of said, hey, so I uh, have two guests. So this is Lisa Barnes next to me. And she's done about 70 audio books and 8,000 voiceovers. And then we have uh, Paula, who is one of these hidden gems that I think not enough people know about. So I said, all right, well, if Paula isn't available, great, we can upgrade. And so at the last minute, she was gracious enough to say, yes, I will help and I will come in and talk. And so you get a very interesting insight because here's something that happens for Paula. And then I'll, I'll, Paula ends up not only directing all sorts of things in terms of audiobooks and people, and she's done some coaching. We met her at the New England Narrators Retreat mm -hmm. where right after the session, Lisa came back to me. Lisa read something in one of Paula's sessions and she came back to me with this super excited, wow, she gave me an insight, and Lisa's been doing this a long time. She has a theater background. But at the same time, uh, Paula gave her one nugget that was probably worth the whole conference. And that's what happens at conferences where you're there and it could happen today. You will hear the one thing that makes your day and gives you an insight that you can take on into every book you do in the future. And we may talk about that today. So Paula, welcome. Thank you for joining us. Uh, great to have you here today. Well, I'm so happy to be here with you, Don and Lisa. Uh, I met you at the last Northeast Narrators Retreat and um, New England Narrators Retreat. And uh, I just liked you right away. You're lovely people and very happy to be speaking with you today. Oh, thank uh, you. Well, thank you. Yeah, yeah. At least, Lisa, you got half of us <laughs> right. Um, so, Lisa, uh, uh, go ahead and so, Paula, one of the things that I don't know, um, I do know that you and Paul both have a background in theater, that that's your roots, I believe. Yes. In, and, uh, and you two met in theater. Can you tell us a little about that, just for fun? And, All right. And, uh, well, about your theater background as well. Sure, sure. Um, it was a summer company, and Paul was a guest artist, and I was one of the members, and... Um, you know, guest artist. Wow. Uh -huh. And, uh, <laughs> but everybody uh, took a liking to him and he made everyone laugh and we had a lot of fun. And, um, I was a redheaded girl back then, but time and tide has taken care of that. And, um, uh, you know, I, I looked at him one day because he had a very big mustache <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> I said to, to a friend of his, wow, he is a very young boy for such a big mustache. <laughs> and so his friend told him that, and he said to his friend, who is that? And so then he pursued, He started showing up wherever I was. If I was taking a drink from the water fountain, there he was. If Smart I, you man. know, and, and so before you know it, he said to me, you're a nice Midwestern girl. You like steaks, don't you? I said, sure. He said, well, would you like to come over and a mistake? I said, sure. So I went over there and it was in his kitchen and there wasn't any steak that I saw. I said, where's the steak? He opened the refrigerator, opened the freezer, took out a pack of hot dogs and he went, tube steaks. I said, uh-oh, I'm in for something with this guy. I don't know. <laughs> and uh, ever since then, he's been making everybody laugh. And, uh, and he's a very 
excellent audiobook and acting coach as well. So that's where we met in the summer in a summer company. Oh, that's fun. Yeah. And yeah. Um, uh, from theater, then uh, you've done a lot of theater over the years, I think, both on stage and directing. Right. I haven't directed theater quite as much as I would like to. So I, I um, would like to put that out. But, um, you know, Paul was a playwright for a time, too. And we did one of his plays off Broadway uh, when I was 22 years old a while ago. I did uh, a, a short run play at the public theater with a director by the name of Maria Piscotter, who was the wife of the great German director, Erwin Piscotter, who was part of the Berliner Ensemble with Bertolt Brecht. And, and that was a very a nice, uh, I guess, a claim to fame that I had, I don't know. But um, at the time that I did that, the theater um, piece there at the public, a young actor was making his off-Broadway debut, and he's a name that everyone knows, um, Al Pacino. And he was in a play called The Basic Training of Pablo Hummel. And no one knew him then. I mean, the New York theater scene did, but that was about it. So, so that was uh, uh, one thing I did. And, um, and then we, uh, we did shows in Chicago. Paul was the director of a dinner theater, we did a show together uh, outside of Chicago called Joe Egg and, uh, by Peter Nichols. It was, it's a great play. It's from the 70s. Um, it's about a couple that had a, a child with special needs. But oddly enough, it's a comedy. And uh, once again, Paul was in for the laughs. And, uh, and then we moved to New York, and, and uh, I, got, I started doing a lot of voiceover jobs. And for children, uh, children's books, and um, and then I found something called ESL, which I did a lot of, which the narrators may know about ESL because a lot of narrators do English as a second language, as well as um, the different voiceover jobs that that you come by. I was Shira, the Princess of Power, for a while, on on um, just tape only, not in the cartoon show, <laughs> and um, I did dub films, feature films, and some cartoons. A lot of narrators worked in Pokemon and, and shows like that. I didn't do any of that, but other cartoons that I dubbed, which is also a very interesting skill to learn. And yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah. I, yeah, so. we, I do a little bit of dubbing here and there on oh, okay. my voiceover stuff, and that stuff is not for the faint of heart. <laughs> no, it's not. I mean, it's all on, on plosives, P's and B's, and once uh, the, you have the one, two, three, and the red light comes on, you got to be ready. So, you know, it's all a skill in developing readiness. Yeah. And you have to have your readiness on stage to be truthful, your readiness on audiobooks to have been prepared, and with every character, your readiness in film dubbing to, uh, to jump on the line when it's there. It's all, it's all prepared, you know, preparing you be, to be ready. Yeah, well, one of the things that I find fascinating is that I think people that do audiobooks, so there's two ways that this whole business goes. There's a ton of people that do voiceover, and then they do some audiobooks. And then there's a bunch of people that do audiobooks, and then they dabble in voiceover. And it crosses back and forth. Mm -hmm, but sure. what I can see is the people that have done audiobooks at a high level tend to be really good when they cross over because they have to do... They're already used to doing characters. They're already used to playing something. They already they already have a wide range. So then when they go and do voiceover, they tend to be really, really good at it when they do mm -hmm. that. Now going the other way, they're surprised because they they end up with some things in an audiobook that just aren't a part of voiceover. I mean, it's different doing a little sprint and something that's two minutes, five minutes, 10 minutes, 20 minutes, or a really long voiceover that's Absolutely. maybe a half hour. Yeah. Then they get into the marathon audiobook stuff where you have to maintain a character over three weeks while you're recording it or other. It's just the people doing audiobooks well tend to be great at voiceover. You find it similar, opposite? What's yeah, what? yeah, absolutely. I find audiobooks is a great training ground in general, if you do enough of them. Because, you know, um, when Paul and I owned our business for a long time, we um, auditioned a lot of actors. And I found that the actors that did audiobooks, they could jump into an audition right away and get the scope of what was going on, at least what they were given. 
and be able to to you know put some type of character or acting to it. They weren't um, uh, searching through. They weren't seeking their way through it as much. They made a decision. Make a decision. Go with it because that's what you have to do. And um, I saw it in lots of different people. And that had done a number of audio books when they went to audition again. Well, Melissa Benson said a golden nugget from Paula. Uh, so she was at the narrator's retreat. That's probably where this came from. I don't know that for sure. Uh, claim the page as your territory. This always gets me motivated to start a new book when I feel less than confident. Um, now, do you, of course, you coached a lot of people over the years, but do you remember this idea? And uh, maybe the, hmm. do you, <laughs> do you remember? Okay. That's the funniest thing. You, know. you do a lot of this stuff. You tell <laughs> yeah. the same thing. I mean, you find the same thing. We, so uh, talk a little bit about okay, the, sure. claiming the page. I don't understand that. I'm not an actor. Sure. So if I want, how do sure. I claim the page? Well, you know, sometimes um, you think as on your feet. And if you're a director, you think on your feet, whether you're doing audiobook directing, theater directing, film, it's, you think on your feet. So if I use a term in one, one time, I may use a different term another time. However, however, um, I think when you step into your booth, you have to get rid of your social self. And so that um, you are uh, ready for, so to speak, the, the audiobook curtain to go up. And um, wh what I always say is that great narrators, great actors, rarely explain. You know, they don't explain, they play. They play, they play the page. They stay on the line. You may, because you've read the book, you may know what's coming before and after, but you stay on the line so that you interpret the feeling that is right there. So I guess that's part of claiming the page as your territory. Um, you know, how can, I, how can I say this? I want the actor to feel very confident when they walk in the booth. And that happens because you are prepared. I really think that a lot of times you're not gonna have, you're not gonna have the time to do it. But, you know, if you can at all, if you can at all, and these are confidence builders, I would, would say, Read the book aloud in the dialogue. Reading only your lines, the lead, the lead character's lines. Don't read the other character's lines. And then read it through again, reading the other character's lines without reading your lines. Wow. That's something that is really, really helpful because you have already been familiar with it. I can't tell you. Any audiobook narrator, once they go through it once, if you go through it again, you will find, just like when you're rehearsing a play, you will, you'll, you'll be stronger. You'll find other things about it. Um, I just did this wonderful book with all these Irish narrators who were film and stage actors. And some of them, they had never done an audio book before, but some of them had, that had done film, when I went back and did some pages over again, which was necessary, they got it. They did it. But, you know, in audio books, a lot of times we don't have, a, you know, like three, five takes or whatever. But when they did the second take, they got it. Now, so I think that, yeah, good. They're going through reading your line, the lead's lines first without the other lines and then reading all the other lines. I, I think that that's a really big help Okay. to helping you claim the territory. Yes. So I have a question. So were you yeah. acting in this book? Were you directing? Were you, were you, no, I was, I would, you were I was the, just, the engineer? I was the director. Okay. <laughs> engineer. Oh my God. Engineer. My hair would be on fire. Can't do it. <laughs> <laughs> okay. But, but go ahead, Lee. Oh, yeah. I was going to ask about a different directing project. Uh, well, well, oh. A, a year ago, roughly, you directed um, Cheetah Rivera. Oh, yes. In narrating her own autobiography. Yes. And she just passed away on mm. January 30th of this That's year, right. just roughly a year after you directed her. What was that like? Well, it was wonderful. I spent 10 days with Cheetah and learned. Um, Who is she? I mean, who she, who well, remember, she is. Remember, remember some of us. I mean, ah, I'm okay. So much all right. Than sure. My wife. Some sure. Of us are not theater I'm, nerds. Sure. <laughs> all right. Okay. Yeah, I'm terribly sorry. Yeah. Um, Cheetah Rivera is, was a Broadway legend. She was the first Anita in West Side Story. Um, she was the first um, Rosie in Bye Bye Birdie. She opened um, uh, Chicago with Gwen Verdon. She uh, won a Tony for The Kiss of the Spider Woman. 
Um, what else? She's done many films that I, I can't even remember. Uh, but mostly um, she was the grand dame, one of the grand dames of theater and a queen in her own right. Absolutely. What a lovely, lovely person. Anything you hear have heard that would make you think, wow, this woman seems like to, is absolutely true. And when I worked with her, she was in the pink of health at 90 years old. Wow. And coming to every session, done up beautifully, makeup on, a, a beautiful body that still could kick high. And um, as she demonstrated, and uh, if, you know, if she passed on, and she did, it was brief. Perhaps it was, I, I don't know, I should really call her assistant and find out, but I, I didn't want to do that right away. And, um, but it was probably a short disease that took her as, you know, it does many elderly people. She was 91. So that was my experience. And what a life she lived. What so was there things you learned as a, I mean, what did you find most interesting about directing somebody who had been, here's the funny thing. So she'd been an actress for decades and, and yeah. has all these world famous credits for my age challenge friends on the, on the, you should go back and watch West Side Story. And the first, yeah, the first really. one, the first one. Yeah. Although that's Rita Moreno in the film. So. Well, I, I'll also tell you that story. Yeah. They, they wanted her to screen test for the lead in the original West Side Story, which would have brought her an even greater claim to fame. But she was in Rosie. She was Rosie in the original Bye Bye Birdie. She had a young baby. And she said to them, you know, this show, it was with Dick Van Dyke. And she said, no, she said, I'm doing this show. I couldn't think of leaving it. And so, you know, uh, yeah, I think that she was being generous to, to the show. And, uh, but that gained her a lot of rewards as well. So, so that was the story on that. Anyway. <laughs> okay. um, let's see. Uh, what about uh, learning from other coaches, other directors? You're close to one. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. What 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 have I learned? Yeah. How, from... how is that for? How does that inform your? Oh, okay. skills and approach. Yeah, and, and yeah. Well, as well. well, I want to interrupt well, before before you yeah. answer that because people in the sure. may not know. One of the unique things that Paula has is a bird's eye view because Paul does a lot of coaching and is at a lot of events. Paula's with him most of the time and she gets to see not only her husband that's a world-class coach, but she gets to sit in on sessions for free with all these other people who are quite famous in the business and so you get to see some things that very few of us will ever get to see from some super high level people and add on top of that all your experience. So is there anything you've learned from all these people that you get to kind of sit in on and, and, and see what they do relative to what you do? You mean the coaches? Yeah. I, you know, I have to tell you the truth. I think we're all different. I think we come from the same place, but we have different language. Um, Paul is big on having the uh, narrator connect with the text, the real feelings underneath. And that is for someone who is not an actor, for someone who is an actor, but um, perhaps doesn't practice stage acting, should I say? Okay. Um, but um, but is, has actor training, but that connection is is also is always elusive and um, Paul calls it phoning it in versus really being connected and when you're doing an audiobook and you're saying every word that's difficult so things that I have taken away from Paul are you know he says less voice don't help the words because words will naturally help themselves so don't think about thinking hitting anything over the head because if you're connected it will flow and it will come out. Um, if you watch British actors, they don't help the words. They trust the language. I love British actors. They trust the language to speak for itself. And I think that's what I and Paul try to do. Because when you sing the narrate, I'm exaggerating. When once upon a time, da 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 da, if you know what's going on in the paragraph, in the scene, you don't have to sing it. 
You know, you will, you will speak it, you won't explain it. You will, you will act it, you will be there. You will be the I that the listener needs. And when, um, when Lisa was talking, be, speaking before, uh, she was talking about what I said as the narrator being a character. And I could put it in another, in another way that the narrator is from the point of view of the protagonist usually. And if you want to give a little character to that, not necessarily a character voice, I don't think that's right, but in your mind, give a character, pick a character for the narrator. That's what I was talking about. And so then you just don't explain something. You play something. And um, how can you, it's difficult when a coach, I'll say Paul, perhaps me, um, gets an actor to be connected how do they do that on their own? How do they do that on their own? It's interesting because it's difficult. Um, I'm working now, uh, I'm assistant directing this wonderful new musical. And I watch the actors who are all great and experienced. Um, do they overdo? Uh, do they connect? You know, what do they, how do they want to play to the audience? Uh, when you're narrating an audiobook, you are playing to an audience. Make no mistake. You are locked arms with the listener. You are conspiring with the listener because you and, and he, they, do not know what's happening next. Only the author does. And so how do you stay connected? It's hard work. It's very hard work. And if you have a line of five audiobooks to do, are you going to connect like that to everyone? Or do you have a way of working to get to the next one? You know, I think I, I read a quote by Carol Burnett recently. And let me pull it up here. If you don't mind, I'm going to block my face for a minute. Okay, just a moment. Yeah. Absolutely. Okay. It's by the great Carol Burnett. And she says, just a moment. She says, okay. When you know the tricks you play to get by, and you like them less and less if you care about your work. I am trying hard to get away from that and sometimes falling back. So I want to address that to all audiobook narrators. Carol Burnett, what she just said, that can happen to you as a narrator. And believe me, if I was in your shoes, you know, making my living from this and having to do book after book, I might fall back on tricks too. But what you don't, you, you don't want to do that. You want to make it as satisfying for yourself as possible, as connected as possible. So how do we keep that connection when we don't have a director there? That's an excellent question. That's the, what, million-dollar pyramid That's question? That's the hard whatever. part. Yeah, yeah. Right, let's well, back up. So normally you're, yeah. you're helping, you're help, like, Johnny Heller this week has a director. Mm -hmm. Johnny Heller has done a crazy number of books where he's self-directed. Right. And I'll bet 95% of our audience, more than that, is going to be self-directing. Yes. So can yes. you talk about how in the world do you self-direct yeah. if you uh, don't have a director? Okay. And I would also, say, if there are yes. any um, common corrections, if you will, suggestions that seem to come up over and over with narrators. Yeah. Okay, so... Like I said, that's the, that's the uh, million dollar question. So how do I do it? Okay, I put myself in that position. How do you connect with something, keep connected? Using less voice, knowing what the stakes are, it's a big thing. Um, not singing, um, uh, less voice, don't even, not helping the words. All right, so how do you, how do you put that all together? Well, as an actor, I think you first have to start out with the serenity of the internal, calmness. I, I say it's kind of like a meditation, okay? So you have to calm yourself down so that you surrender to, how, what, to what you're going to be performing, serenity of the internal. You relax yourself, you lay everything else upon that. Um, I, I watch, I go to theater, I watch movies, I watch on YouTube, I watch great actors. And they all have the serenity of the internal. For instance, Daniel Day-Lewis, and I'll give you two examples. 
if you watch Phantom, of, uh, Phantom Thread, if you watch Lincoln, no matter what the character uh, attributes are, he has serenity of the internal. He goes from that relaxed, serene place, and then he adds on character um, aspects, gestures, how they are. Even when you're in uh, a, a, an emotional scene, you still have the serenity of the internal. And actors, a lot of times, they will, even when you're doing audiobooks, they will start, start a line when they'll, they'll break the breath. They'll go, <sighs> you know, you don't ever want to break a breath. You want to take a breath and say what you're going to say on that breath. Um, and I don't know, um, does this, is, is this helpful? Does this sound helpful by the serenity of the internal? I watch great actors on stage. Inside they are serene. Outside they are dealing with what they're dealing with. But inside they're still serene. Does that make sense? It does. I think it goes with that owning the page that you had mentioned to Melissa. Okay. You know, yes. It seems yes. Like those are yes. related or two parts and, of the same. Yes. And um, if, if if that's not clear, please please let me know. But but go ahead then, and if you have time to watch Daniel Day Lewis, and watch him, the serenity of the internal exists, and everything else. And Killian Murphy is the exact same way. If you watch him in Oppenheimer. For example, he has serenity of the internal, and everything comes from that serenity, that giving up of who you are, that disrobing of yourself, that donning the cloak of truth, and the serenity of the internal. And then, you know, you, you narrate from there, you act from there. So if and, you're getting yeah. started like, so I'm not an actor. Yeah. Now, most, almost everyone here, is an actor or yeah. becoming one. Yeah. Uh, how do I gain more serenity? Like, uh, pretend I'm not doing it, but I'm not doing it here. So what, what would, <laughs> how do you help me get serene? How do you help me? Is that a, an experience thing? Is that a take some acting lessons? Is that a have a director for a while? What's, what are the bet? What are things you can think of? Okay. Okay. It comes from experience. Yes. It comes from taking some acting lessons. Absolutely. Um, it comes from, just like I was saying, going into the booth, you know, donning, uh, taking off your social self. Um, the great, I would give big, the great Patrick Stewart said donning the cloak of truth. He, he, the best, the greatest actors he, he's worked with, don the cloak of truth, whatever that would mean to you. Also, what I was saying about breathing and taking a breath instead of breaking the breath and saying the line, taking a breath and saying the line. That way you don't disconnect. How do you stay connected? Now, this is also a technical way. Okay. Instead of having your voice come from the back of your throat, just like a singer, have the voice come from the front palate. Hit, hit the voice in right in back of your, the, the, the hard palate, the front, right in back of your front teeth. And then that goes right to your brain, and that will connect you with your emotions. You just have to practice this skill, and you'll see what I'm talking about. It, it'll place it right in the front of your face. And then you can't, you know, you, 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 you'll, you'll sing the song, you'll sing the lines less if you do that. Back of your hard palate. And it's, it's much better than putting it in the back of your throat. Um, you know, if you watch great singers, that's what they do. Um, I don't know. Is, does this sound helpful? Yeah, I was going to ask you if you find that um, for actors who aren't already singers that do yeah. need some voice lessons, singing lessons. Yeah, uh, yes. And, and um, even, even just working with a voice coach, uh, a, a dialect coach maybe, um, will help. But I think locating the voice in the front of the mouth as opposed to the back really helps you connect. Um, that's one uh, non-organic, well, it could be organic. That's one technical device that I, that I have worked with myself and have taught before. And then, of course, um, practicing the, the serenity of the interior. Um, and uh, yeah, those are a couple of ways. Also, using less voice, not helping the words. 
taking a breath rather than breaking a breath. Um, because when you take a breath, the listener takes a breath with you. How many times have you seen actors, uh, and of course, to, to emphasize this, I come from the stage acting, but actors will <sighs> break a breath before <sighs> they say a line, um, as opposed to taking a breath before they say a line. Um, also, I find that when actors are working or narrators are working, you know, pronouns, um, uh, 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 prepositions, they're, <clears throat> they're thieves, not to hit me, I. Sometimes you can, you do. <clears throat> but if you constantly hit, excuse me, <clears throat> pronouns and prepositions, it's going to rob the sentence. Also, to, and you will find that you start to do this naturally. If you obey, I say obey, the punctuation. If you have a little, have, you know, a small stop at a comma, a full stop at a period. It gives the listener time to catch up, gives you time to catch up. So obeying the punctuation. Also separating he said, she said, they said from the dialogue. It really is effective. And you know, it, you do have to think about that. But if you start doing it, it just is natural. And it really makes the dialogue pop. It really does. So I want to go back to uh, your, yeah. your uh, pla placing the voice uh, in different places uh, in yeah, your head. Yeah. Your, mm -hmm. So uh, for those of you that don't, don't have never sung or taken acting classes where people have done that, Lisa was a singer long before, I mean, just her whole life, and took a bunch. And so she understood this stuff because that was her background. I took, I took voice lessons when I was in my 20s, uh, and I happened to get an opera singer here that's famous. Uh, because I had some connections, not because I deserved it. And it was only through going through some singing lessons that I actually, Lisa would say something about, no, 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 don't do it that way. Uh, but I just didn't, I didn't get it until I was with somebody in person who could execute and show me the difference of you have an option when you talk about all sorts of details. And it was going to a coach for me that made this major difference because they could show me and they had exercises that would allow me to do both uh, many different things with my voice and where the placement was. So when people talk about that, I just remember going, what the heck? I don't get any of this stuff. What do you mean? Play? I talk. I did not understand that I had an option about the way I produce yeah. sound. And yeah. that was a big revolution, revelation for me when I had somebody. So, hey, many of you out there, if you're, if you're as unclear as I was, you probably need to go to a Paula. You need to go to somebody who can help you with that and help you work through it because it just sounds like, okay, okay, I'm going to talk. I don't need all that crap. And then when you get it and have the ability to change and, and, and know where your focus is in terms of placement, right, it's right. eye-opening to have the back of your head vibrate. I remember him setting his hand on the back of my head and then having me do it. They do these exercises where you can feel the vibration in different points. It's amazing, but it's not something that I just thought, like, you guys are nuts. They're, th this isn't really doable by normal people. There's something wrong with her is kind of what I remember <laughs> thinking. Uh, well, I, I'm just trying. Oh, sorry, Don, if you're yeah. continuing. No, no, you're so so you're. Yeah, so. I, I, I was just trying to give a technical way for mm -hmm. the actor to to be um, to be connected when he doesn't he she they don't have a director. And that's one of the ways, um, because I know it's difficult. You can coach with a great coach like Paul, like Johnny, et cetera, and, and they can get you there. But then how do you duplicate that when you're by yourself? Yeah, that's the so, big question. Yeah, so that's why I was talking about the serenity of the interior, the relaxation, uh, and, then play, and then voice placement, okay. which would, would help you connect. So I'll Definitely. say that kind of in a different way, I think. Um, yeah, you have to go you for most of us. We're going to go to a coach and we're going to learn some of these techniques and we are going to have to practice it a whole lot so that we are confident and we can walk in and own it because we have the confidence in what we're doing. Is that close? Yes, absolutely. And also, um, you know, if in your area, wherever you live, there's a class, a link ladder class that somebody is giving the link ladder technique, 
I have no Kristen idea what Link. that is. What is that? There's a, a great voice coach teacher named uh, Kristen Linklater, L-I-N-K-L-A-T-E-R. She was, she's the great. I mean, actors know who she is. And there's a technique, a Linklater technique. That will, you know who Linklater is, right, Lisa? You know what? I didn't. I, at first, I thought, this is someone related to Art Linklater? Of the no, <laughs> no, no, no. Kristen Linklater. I don't know but she, she oh, she's, she's great. You, you guys would love her. Um, she moved back. She's elderly, and she moved back to Scotland, but she still teaches in Scotland. But she's very famous in the theatrical world. And if you even got a book about the Linklater technique, that would help you understand voice placement. She also talks about placing the brain somewhere. Oh, la la, I wish that I had written this quote down. But I, I, a friend of mine can give me the quote. It's about, uh, about placing your brain on the page or something. I mean, it's a great quote, but sorry, you guys. <laughs> but anyway, um, yeah, I, I mean, that's, that's what I have to say. Also, watch British narrators, I mean, actors. They simply do not, I mean, American ac actors are tied into emotions and da 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 da. And British actors trust the language. They just let it go. And, and in letting it go, it will emphasize itself. The language will emphasize itself through you. It really will, trust me. That's what you know. my darling Paul says, don't help the words. The words will help themselves, absolutely. So why do you think and, British uh, actors are better at that overall as a category? I mean, I know that's generalization than American actors. Yeah. Why do you think hmm. that might be? I think it's the way they're trained. I think they're trained to, I mean, they, you know, um, theater is their art. Musicals are our art. Gilbert and Sullivan belong to them, but musicals are our art. Theater is their art. The, um, and, uh, and so it's the way they're trained. I think, you know, if you watch um, a Judy Dench do a Shakespeare sonnet, the words are the words. She doesn't emphasize anything. She just speaks it beautifully. And, and that's what they do. And um, they trust the language to, to define itself. She seems to I, have kind of a wide, uh, a wide, <laughs> you're talking about her doing uh, probably Shakespeare and, uh, mm -hmm. and, it, and, and yet uh, all I know her from is, hey, uh, hey, she's the lady in uh, James Bond. <laughs> Okay. Yeah, yeah, I mean, yeah. But why, watch her do that. Watch so Dumbo do that, doesn't you know? know. I mean, I didn't know how well trained she is, but clearly, oh, yeah. she has this massive range that she can go out and do theater, traditional theater, and modern theater, and turn around and be a character that is in multiple bonds. And many of us younger people, <laughs> that's all I know. Her for. I wasn't in the theater. But uh, that's yeah. what you, the British actors seem to have a wider range than uh, many here. But and you believe that's their training, right? I think it's their training. Yes, and I, and and I think it's ability as well. But I think it's their training. Absolutely. What were you going to say, Lisa? Sorry. I was going to say I stumbled upon a, a YouTube video some time ago. Um, I think it was a talk show. And Judy Dench was being interviewed, and I don't remember how they prefaced. They asked her to say, and she just off the cuff reeled off a, a sonnet and just so simply and so beautifully. Simple, you know? simple, and simple, just that simple, not simple. Helping the words. <laughs> yes, yes. Everybody in cries in art to interpret for themselves. Okay. Everybody has an opinion about it. But I think they don't really want to be spoon fed. They want simplicity. And I'm assistant directing this new Irish musical that is just wonderful. And the opening number in any show, musical, straight play, whatever it is, audiobook, has to, has to really hit home. And the simpler, and this is a difficult staging, this number was. But the director has now gotten it down to being very simple. And it's really good and um i think this more simple simplify make decisions when you're doing a book just like an actor would on stage come with a pocket full of choices you know and if you have time to rehearse it yourself um if you wouldn't mind i'm just going to read you something i'll go on uh turn my cab camera off for a moment 
turned it off, sorry. All right, so if you have time, this is the six ways to read a script, okay? And do all of it or some of it, you know? It's called the monastic read. You, you read it quiet, slow, objective. You do the Google read, a quick language and reference check, right? The research read, you fill in the gaps in your knowledge. And you can make this up if the author hasn't provided it. Just make it up. And you'll find that that gives you a real bedrock for from which to work, you know? Um, then you read all the lead lines, all the protagonist lines, and then you speak, you, you speak all the protagonist, then you speak the other lines, all right? And what you want to try to do is this will help you broaden your internal emotional life. Whatever emotion comes up as you read this, just let it be. Go with it. You know, you're by yourself. And, and even in recording, if you cry, you cry. If you laugh, you laugh. This helps build the blocks of your emotional life. I also want to speak about um, lift your performance to a bigger idea. Lift it to your performance to a bigger idea. You know, when you're reading a book, the narrator and the listener, you are just a beggar who is telling another beggar how to find the piece of bread. I don't, who, who did I get that quote from? Um, I don't know, but I loved it. And so I wrote it down. You are just a beggar helping the listener find out where you found that piece of bread and let yourself be known to your listener. This is me. Simple, great, it's me. As I said, lift your performance up to a bigger idea and do what Carol Burnett has found she wants to do. You know, you know your tricks, you play to do, go on to the next book. Do them less and less if you care about your work. And uh, Carol said, I was trying hard to get away from them, but sometimes I'm not perfect, I fall back. So. I also want to tell you, as I have been, as I do, look at the great actors. Go to movies. Go, if you can go to theater. Um, also look on YouTube. If there is a movie that you see and you like the actor's work, find that scene on YouTube. I watch the dinner scene in August Osage with Meryl Streep. I have watched that scene 30 times because the actors they're all wonderful, but watching her, they up their game. It is one of the most beautiful scenes I've ever seen played. And then you can watch her and the great Jim Broadbent when she is Margaret Thatcher and she's losing her mind and she sees her husband, I forget what his name is, you know, come back and he's going to work. And these are just scenes that I've seen. Also, this is really great and it's great for audiobooks. Watch YouTube and movies, the great Billy Crudup. I'm telling you, this guy is How do you spell his name? Billy and then Crudup, K-R-U-D-U-P. He has a lead in the new morning show, that television on Apple TV+. Plus. I love it. I just love that show. But Billy, no matter what he does, he comes from somewhere when he gets into that scene. He comes from somewhere. He's been somewhere. Make it up. Where your or if you know where your character came from, they just don't start saying lines. They have come from somewhere. They've come from somewhere personally in their body, and they've come from somewhere mentally. So come from somewhere. It's so good when you do that. And you don't need to be on a stage or on film. You have, that book is in front of you. Come somewhere from somewhere in that scene as the character. You know? And, and I really realize that all of you really don't have all that time to prepare, but if you do, it makes all the difference in the world. And, um, and all of the things that I'm, that we're talking about, will kind of happen naturally. It's really strange how this goes. And then you'll say, oh, the serenity of the interior? Well, was that? You know, but you'll get it, you'll get it. And watch Daniel Day-Lewis, please go and watch him. Even if it's, if you watch the movie, The Phantom Thread, you will know exactly what I'm talking about. You will see that in action, the serenity of the interior, and then what he does with the character comes out of that. 
That's your foundation inside, relaxation. That's where the connection will happen. Um, use, your, use your voice to, to most of your voice, speak to the front of your mouth, the hard palate, because that will help you connect as well, instead of keeping everything in the back of your throat. Um, I was wondering um, when you were talking about uh, British actors and yeah. the training, um, since I do British as well in voiceovers. Oh, yes, yes, that, yes. Okay. Um, I think wow. the, that placement and the way that they speak possibly helps in uh, that keeping that simplicity yes, because yes, the words yes. will handle themselves when you've got that diction happening. Lisa, the words will handle themselves. I'm going to write that down right now. The <laughs> I'm just words will, what you said. It's beautiful though. The words will handle themselves. And you know, they go through a lot of speech training. Because I, I did I did uh, um oh I did a summer at RADA um a few summers ago and I definitely was the elder statesman there, but did I learn? You bet I did. And um they do a lot of voice training. Wait, you don't lot. know it all already and just <laughs> so here's no the thing way no yeah. way okay but okay so let's let's break this down though musicians do the same thing if i like a song and you do it so i i see a thread here um yes, yes musicians yes. uh great actors they do this one thing they find scenes from the some of the best in in the world that they like and then yes. they watch it 30 times yes why yes. well how come you can't just watch it once and then say i know it because of the joy is in the watching and the joy is in perhaps passing some of that along to someone at some point that's the joy for me i remember my brother who um is a salesman and a very a very successful one when paul and i did um a, a, an improv company called the laughing stock we did that and we performed all over with a with a troupe that we put together and he said to me my brother when he came to watch us he goes you know, you all get a lot of joy out of your work. I said, absolutely. So doing, sitting down in front of that mic in your beautiful room, when you take off, when you leave your social self behind and you, and you don the, the cloak of truth and you go to your uh, internal serenity, um, the serenity of the internal, and then you, the curtain goes up and you begin and you come from some place, even as the narrator, you're coming from some place because you're telling this story and ready to go. And the joy starts from there. Well, here's something that I find interesting. A lot of uh, you people, uh, you people, you people, <laughs> Yo, you peoples seem to have some sort of improv background. Uh, I hear you say it, and so many other people that have been doing this really at a high level. How has that influenced your ability to go in and, uh, you know, work on an audiobook? Do you think yeah. it's helpful? Should I take it, if I were going to do this, should I be taking an improv class if I've never done it? <laughs> I, I'll tell a little truth now. I was not a great improviser. Um, I was in the company, sure. I did, I did, you know, sketches and stuff. My husband, on the other hand, is a fantastic improviser. It's just because, you know, comedians are, they're great. Look at, look at SNL, you know? Um, you know, you cannot, when somebody in an improv, when somebody throws you something, you can't say no. You have to say yes and. Okay, so how does yes and help in audiobooks? I, yeah, would, I, say, I would say that it helps you if you have time to rehearse and if you don't. It helps you create characters on the fly if you know that character is coming up. I mean, I have seen some audiobook narrators create characters on the fly and my chin, my jaw drops for sure. Yeah. At, did, did they take improv classes? I don't know. I don't know. But they've had so, some background, right? You think, or are they just making it up like I could? <laughs> Maybe I, don't I can make it up badly. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, I don't know. I mean, if you, if you take a class in that, you'd find surely if, it, if it's for you or not. It didn't happen to be for me. Like I said, I could do sketch work, memorize lines. I was, I was a champ at memorizing lines. I mean, I could memorize an act in an afternoon. But um, I don't know if you want to do that either. So, but uh, the improv, yeah. I mean, you know, if you're attracted to it at all, I don't know if it would help in audiobook narration. 
All right. Well, that's good to know. Yeah. 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 I mean, I, I think preparation, prepping your books is very, is helpful. And all these other techniques that we talked about, you know, um, however yes. many they are. Yeah. So I've noticed that um, you, Joanna Perrin, me, even though what I've accomplished is so little compared to you and Joanna. Oh, um, I don't think we that's kind true. Of have these larger than life guys <laughs> and we kind of fly under the radar screen to some extent. And yeah. yet uh, there was a panel at the New England narrators retreat uh, this past one um, with all the women coaches and narrators and um, something that I think everybody that was present in that room took away from it was the, this is my rate idea right. of, you right. know, kind of, of course you have to be flexible, but also standing your ground and standing up for yourself. Um, yes. How has that played into things for you over the years? Uh, any thoughts on that sort of well, women in the, in theater <laughs> women in theater women in narration women directing yeah I mean you know I mean I've been doing this a long time and so um, when I go in to direct something I direct at the highest rate probably that that particular publisher with it's my rate and um, you know I don't work for any less but um, I, you know if you have a relationship with the particular publisher I just don't see what's wrong with saying, this is my rate. I know a lot of actors are hesitant to do that because it's how they make their living and they don't want to, you know, but, but um, you know, you can just say, would the budget for this book uh, support me, my rate for this, for this book being whatever you'd like to, you know, whatever you'd like to charge, a fair jump. Or you can say, uh, if 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 um, if the budget for this book supports, and if you think this is fair, I'd like my rate for this book to be X. I think people respond a lot to the word fair, so you might use that um, in the future. So you're always asking for a fair rate, and what I think Lisa is getting at is that uh, are there some people in this business that are not ever asking for a higher rate when they pr might probably deserve a higher rate, but they aren't asking for it. Is that close? Perhaps. Um, you know, you have to also think about the leverage you have with that particular publisher. If you don't have any leverage at all with them, um, you have to know how well your, some of your titles have done. Um, but in, in the business, as in an audiobook, narration is a business. You have to see the leverage that you have with a particular publisher. If you've done X amount of titles and you've done well, you've gotten good reviews, there's no reason to not ask for a higher rate. They can tell you. I think they go book by book too, but if they use you a lot and you would like to raise your rate, there is nothing wrong with asking for more. If you say, this is my rate no matter what, then, you know, that's, you have to stand by what you've asked for. Also, um, you and I are in an exclusive club, the Grandma's Club. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, uh, mm. um, has that, uh, do you feel parenting your son and now being a grandma, has any of that played into or informed your choices as a director, as a narrator? Actor. Well, I must confess that if I've had, I hope none of the publishers are watching, no, if I've had a, a, a family event planned and I'm offered something at the same time, I do take the family event over something that I may have been offered. Yeah. Because, you know, at my point in life, that's what I choose to do. Yeah, I, it, it, it always kind of cracks me up. Uh... Lisa's turned down way more than she's taken over the years just because sometimes, you know, we had five kids and there were points yeah, in the journey where it was like, oh, do we need to have two, other, you know, two other books going? No, it doesn't make any sense to do that right. where we're at. Right. And she right. didn't need to do it at that point. And so she didn't. 
And that seems to me to be a, a totally reasonable thing at different points based on where you're at. And, uh, you know, we all have yeah. to make choices to sometimes say, hey, I've got something else going on. The yeah, exactly. it's, really, it's really hard as an artist, though. Yes, it is. Yes, since it you is. don't know what's coming up six months from now. That is true. It can be very yeah. tough to trust that if I turn down this one, will there be something else coming down the road? So hats yeah. off to you for, for doing that and making those choices. And, uh, you know, it's definitely one of those things that's really tough. Um, well, we're, we're having a blast with her. I mean, Paul and I, we do voices. She loves it. She's <laughs> yeah. two and a half years old, and now she has this little doll. And his name, his name, is Buddy Boy. And Buddy Boy has a voice. But Buddy Boy speaks now. She has a voice for Buddy Boy. So I don't know what we're doing, but <laughs> 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 but we're having, we're having fun. Right. I know um, decades ago, um, our oldest son, Donnie, uh, who's very accomplished voice actor and uh -huh. also sports wow. broadcaster. Wow. Um, he he uh, heard, I think he was at a soccer practice and another mom was reading to her other children that weren't at the practice. He was walking by and he, he heard this mom reading aloud a book to the other children. And he thought to himself, you're not doing it right. <laughs> it was a book he was familiar with. And that's just because mom was always reading these things in character voices. So oh, my, yeah, there our you son, go. our kids all thought that that's just what moms do. Right. They and, Every and animal if it, has if a... It's, <laughs> if it's a British setting, I just can't. I have to read it British. Look at you know, that. I look just, at that. Look at that. Well, Paul does... can't read Harry aloud. Paul I mean, does his character... <laughs> of course not. But Paul does his character... And our granddaughter asks for the character. Oh, my God, it's unbelievable. So anyway, it's cool. So it's uh, very I, cool. I, I, uh, you know what? One of the things I thought of, for people that are self-directing, do you recommend that they, uh, first off, you, you can't go back and change something in the current book very often. Sometimes there's, there isn't enough time in the budget right, right, to right, do right. that. So should they maybe take their own director's notes and, or, or somehow evaluate their performance later? go back and listen to something and take notes and then they can incorporate it into the next book. Boy, that is a great idea, Don. I, I think that is so valuable. And just like a director takes notes uh, of, of, of a show that they're working on, I take notes for the director every single day. I type them up, I send them to, to the director, I read them over. God, that is so helpful, Don. Yes. Go back and do that, and then you'll, you'll find if you're connected, if perhaps you're coming from that serenity of the internal, you might, you, you'll be able to hear it. If you're obeying the punctuation and what value you think that adds, if you're separating the assignation from the dialogue to see if the dialogue pops more, if you're helping the words too much, if you're singing the narration, singing the dialogue, if you're letting the, the words uh, uh, speak for themselves, if you're, what, what was the phrase that you said, Lisa? Uh -huh. um, if you're not helping the words, um, if you're being simple, if you're coming from a place when you are in a scene, uh, uh, you know, if you're coming from, make sure you're coming from somewhere in your mind. You know, as actors, we make up a lot of stuff. We make up a lot of SH, you know what I mean? And it's just, it's just to build that character, you know, and take the, the words from, from, uh, from Carol Burnett. Don't use your tricks. Go back and, and do the best work you possibly can so that you're proud of yourself when you send that file in and you salute there. Another one sails off. Take time to be prepared. Take time to read aloud the leads lines. Um, take time to read aloud just in the scenes um, uh, of the, the, the secondary lines. Um, these are just little tips that can help you. Uh, treat your, 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 your booth as a sanctuary. Look at it as a sanctuary. Um, remember, you are locked elbows with the listener. It is your job to, to you, are ver you, are, you are helping them visualize. And so because they don't have the book in front of them, helping them visualize so that they can comprehend what's going on. That is a very important part of your job. Um, and don't keep hitting me, I, 
you know, don't hit those pronouns. Oh, it robs the sentence most of the time. Hmm. What, what well, else? <laughs> yeah, you're amazing. No, and and that uh, we're gonna have to pull that out as a uh, as a, the the whole session here. As awesome. I do know as a musician, I never could in the moment evaluate my own work. If I listen back a week or two yes. later, I could always go, oh, that part was, that part actually Absolutely. worked. I'm happy with that part. Absolutely. And that part I'm embarrassed about. But, uh, and then one, one final trick. Uh, one of the things that Lisa and I did over time was, you mentioned earlier about the first chapter has to pop. The first chapter yes. has to be great. Yes. In, or yes, the first yes. part of the show. The first song in the musical. Yeah. Yes, and but, so but absolutely. I should, I should have said this, Don, because, you know, you're casting your line out there. You have to reel the listener in. Right. And after the first, I don't know, seven pages or yeah. wherever you feel that the beat changes after the first five to seven pages, you got them. Right. But if you have to go back, thank you for bringing this up, Don. If you have to go back and do those over again, Absolutely. I do it in almost every book I direct. <laughs> well, here's a funny thing. So we discovered this on our own. If a book has 23 chapters, we mentally say it has 24 chapters because a lot of times by the time Lisa gets to the whole book, she's got now the characters and the voice. I mean, she thought she knew it up front from her prep, but there's a difference when you've done it. And a lot uh -huh. of times we know if you don't get them in the first chapter, You'll never get to tw chapter 23, so therefore no. we would re-record chapter one after we had done everything else because now everything is so clear for the actor and how they're going to voice and where it's going. One hundred percent. And we want to have that first chapter be as good as chapter 23 when everything was in the flow. And That's so, right. eighty percent of the time, we're we're meant we're always mentally thinking. The book has one more chapter than whatever it has. Yes, yes, And then if yes. we don't think it needs it because she nailed it on the first one, cool. But if she has any, oh, I don't think chapter one is as good, she'll redo that one because if we get them in the first chapter, we've got a chance for them getting through the book. Correct. But if you don't Correct. get it at the beginning. Don. Johnny Correct. said the same thing one time. Uh, Absolutely. He talked about going back and redoing chapter one. <laughs> yep. You... Absol Absolutely. Yep. You know, it's, you know, if you're doing film, it's, you know, take 10 or something. You, you know what I mean? Yeah, right. You know, just like, yes, at that it holds true always. Yeah, it's got to be great. All right. Well, you're an awesome person, and I know you do some coaching, and I know you're busy, so you can't do everybody, uh, but... Mm -hmm. How would somebody get a hold of you? Uh, should they go through Paul's uh, to get to you? Should they contact no. you directly? What's, you, how, what's the best way to check, catch up with yeah, you? Yeah, my email is P and then Parker and then Ruben. Two P's in the beginning, two R's in the middle at Gmail. P Parker Ruben. Gmail. Is Ruben. Ian. Ian. Ian, Ian. Ian. For anyone that's out there, don't ever trust Don's spelling, okay? <laughs> but so many people spell the sandwich, nah. So many people <laughs> spell it I-N, nah, it's Ian. Uh, yeah, but, but even uh, if I, yeah, but I'm the wrong one uh, to, to take on any of this stuff. So you see it, I'm going to highlight it on screen there and make sure, did I get that right? That is absolutely correct. Okay, yes. that's a win for me because it doesn't happen yeah. very often. All right, so uh, for those of you Paul is one of those hidden gems that I think if more, so Lisa came back so excited. I just, she's not, I don't want to say she's, she's a little tainted in that she has enough background in this that she'll yes, come indeed. and she'll get some little tips. She did her session with you and she came back so excited. And I'm like, wow, mm -hmm. whatever, whatever this lady said had to be brilliant <laughs> because she's complimentary and said, yeah, that was cool. I learned a few things, but this one, she was like, wow, this is just this one shift is making my whole concept so much stronger. And I do think that's a great thing about somebody coming to a coach like you is they may not get 400 things. They're looking for the one or two things that can change how they're thinking yes, about yes. doing this whole process. Correct, so, correct. Any uh, final? Because, you, yeah, and, oh, sorry, sorry, Don. Sorry, yeah, Don. go for it. Um, we want, as narrators and as me speaking to you, we want, I want you to feel all the joy you can possibly feel and never feel like um, uh, uh, it's, it's drudgery or that you're unsure. Because every time you come up to bat, you'll get better and better and better. 
And you know, when you study with people, when you go to conferences, just make sure, you know, as it appears that you do, you take good notes and you go over them. And as Don suggested so excellently, take some time to listen and take your own notes about uh, the latest audiobook that you've done and see what you might do differently based on things that you've learned. And, uh, and as we also talked about, Don mentioned too, you know, great actors, great musicians, great mathematicians, they study, they keep studying. Yeah. And should you, should you have the means to do so, it's an excellent idea. Um, if you've never taken an acting class, take an acting class. It will help you perhaps get to that, um, you know, serenity of the internal. And because uh, for me, I think that's very important. But that's what All I have right. to say. More and more joy. Well, thank you for being so gracious and stepping in at the last minute when they are no Not good people all. Not at had all. these other <laughs> things with major publishers that they're doing. Um, so greatly appreciated that you're here. Uh, thank you for being here, Paula. And it, w it was so such my pleasure, really, so my pleasure. I oh, appreciate. thank you. And then for, for everyone on the show, of course, we're back next Tuesday. I don't remember who it is. Uh, but I promise you we'll have someone else that's uh, not as good but is a nice person as well. And then uh, later today, I always have my tech show on Tuesdays where it's just tech only. So that happens at 2 o'clock uh, Pacific time, and that's 5 o'clock Eastern. I did that math in my head. So be sure to join us. Be sure to subscribe to the channel. We're very happy you're here. And, of course, we'll see you next week. And, as always, we'll see you on the wires. You have a fantastic day. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.